May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do take a seat. One person climbs each step of the stairs to speak to you, while three people sit on stools, watching, and perhaps even listening. <laughs> Steps, stairs, and stools. Let us begin with the steps and stairs. When I was a child, I used to spend quite a bit of time lying on my back, on the floor, staring up, looking at the ceiling. And I would imagine that the house was turned upside down so that the ceiling was now the floor and I could walk around the floor avoiding the light fittings and maybe the smoke alarms. If I lay down in the hallway, I would look up at the backs of the steps and stairs that led down from the floor above. Of course, the downward stairs were now leading up rather than down. And this optical illusion is famously played out in the works of a Dutch artist named M.C. Escher. Famously, he would draw a series of interconnected staircases, where if one followed each step, they were always going down from one point of view, or always going up from another. And they were arranged in a triangle, such that you would always end up where you started. Well, how can that be? Because they're only ever going in one direction. A person is ascending and descending the steps at the same time. Optical illusion, contradiction, mystery, and paradox. Paradox is often found in the sayings of Christ. For example, the first will be last and the last will be first. He who wants to save their life must lose their life. Paradox helps us remember the limits of the human mind, that our powers of reason, however great we believe, have limits which only God can transcend. Now, imagine three of those Escher-type staircases connected in that incomprehensible triangle. This is but one way to picture the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. And of course, it's Trinity Sunday today, the Sunday that most preachers dread. How does one explain this paradox, the paradox of the Holy Trinity, three persons in one, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? three distinct persons, one essence. Well, you won't find the doctrine of the Holy Trinity set out in the Bible. It was developed by the early church fathers, then first codified in the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, about 300 years after the life of Christ, and then amended some 60 years later. And we come to the words of the Nicene Creed, which we will say after this sermon. And the first things we will say are that we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. So God is creator, inseparable from all creation. And we know from the first book of Genesis that creation is not a Manichaean battle between good and evil, black and white, either or. God sees creation as all good. It's a both and. That number three that divides um, impossibly into one. And then in the creed, we encounter Christ. God of God, light of light, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. Christ, the Son who redeems us from sin and death who for us and for our salvation, salvation comes down from heaven. Christ in his passion and resurrection bequeaths to us the all-consuming power of love and forgiveness, the power to transform us so that we may enter fully into the life of God. And finally, we encounter the Holy Spirit. 
And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. That Holy Spirit that we celebrated last Sunday in the festival of Pentecost as set out in Acts, the sending of the Holy Spirit on the people 50 days after Easter, filling them with understanding like that understanding that we heard in the Book of Wisdom this morning, like that spirit of truth that we heard from John, throughout the New Testament, the Holy Spirit gains a number of names. Comforter, Advocate, Spirit of Truth, Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. So, there seems to be a straightforward biblical line from God, creator in Genesis, to Christ, redeemer in Gospels, to the sending forth of the Holy Spirit, sustainer in the book of Acts. Creator, redeemer, sustainer, straight line, easy. But even in the Bible, the line is not in one direction, but up and down and around. The Holy Spirit, which we saw at Pentecost, is first there as the Spirit hovering over creation, over the waters of the deep at the very beginning. And just as Christ is also there at the very beginning, as we know from the prologue to John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, and in God, that is Christ. And so, not a linear line, as we thought, up, down, and around. But so what? We're not here for some dry academic or sterile lecture. The Trinity must have meaning in our lives. It must be pastoral and psychological in order for us to understand the outworking of God. Some of us may be going through grieving and sorrowful times. People we were in relationship with may be missing from us. People we hope and are promised to remain in relationship with eternally. You see that the love that the Trinity reveals is that God is constantly in relationship with humanity, just as we are in relationship with each other. God only works in relationship. As Richard Raw would put it, we live a divine dance with God, and we hope to see that loving dance outworking in our lives. And there will be different times when we are more likely to see the goodness of God, the Creator, times when we experience the forgiveness and restoration of God, the Redeemer, times when we depend on the comfort of God, the Holy Spirit, sustaining us on our pilgrimage. And there will be many times when we need goodness, forgiveness, and comfort from God and from others. And in this divine dance, we do not end up where we started. As we hear in Romans, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see, we may climb steps and descend steps and sometimes feel that we have come back to the same place. But if we walk with God, it is promised that we will be transformed by love so that we may enter the eternal life of the kingdom of God, the spirit within us, Christ amongst us, God beyond us. And what about those stools I mentioned? Well, since early times, the theology of the Church of England has been described as, as if it were established on a three-legged stool. There being three sources of authority or inspiration for our faith. Without each of the three, there is no balance, no platform on which our faith may rest. The first leg is the foundation of scripture. Those who place greater emphasis on this often described as evangelical. 
within the Anglican tradition. The second leg of the stool is tradition. Those who place great emphasis described as Catholic, Anglo, um, Catholic Anglicans or Anglo-Catholic. And the third leg of the stool, reason. Those who place great emphasis on this being liberal or liberal Anglicans. Scripture, tradition, reason, the three. But labels should not divide us because each leg is necessary to balance our relationship with God and with each other. They each transform. One person climbs each steps of the stairs to speak to you, while three people sit on stools watching. The person descends the steps to return from where they came, but does not arrive at the same place. All will be transformed. Amen.